You see Meteor Crater here, I advise you to visit it if you're in the area, it's in Arizona. It's a very small one and it's only 50,000 years old. But this is the result of a projectile impacting the Earth at um, very, very high velocity. Indeed, if you look at collision and impact, this is for sure the most common geological process in the solar system. It's everywhere. It's, of course, on the moon. You guys are probably too young, but the first hit on the internet was the impact of Shoemaker-Levy 9, the comet impacting on Jupiter. There's supposed to be a picture of another comet right here with craters. You have craters on everything in the asteroid belt. Here is Ceres. You have small craters on Pluto. You have a big one on Europa. You have huge one, 1,250 kilometers on Mercury, and you have one of the NASA rovers here climbing out of the Gale Crater on Mars. So I don't know if life is all over in the solar system, but I can tell you for sure that it, impact craters are all over the solar system. And basically, the habitability of our planet, the fact that we have made the Earth, well, we've turned the Earth into a planet that is fully capable to host life, if for a large part due to the impact of a projectile that you see here being, or I would say hitting the Earth or the proto-Earth something around 4.5 billion years ago to form the Moon. This is an animation that shows how it happens. And I would recommend, this is the YouTube, and it's a very good interview. The projector is very poor here, so you cannot read it, but you'll have the slide. This is an interview by Robin Canop, who came up with this theory that explains very well why it's so important to have a moon to basically stabilize everything that's happening on Earth. And we can have a good idea of the dates of this impact. It's somewhere around 60 to 95 million years after the formation of the first solids in the solar system. So this is this impact, this moon forming impact is something that happened very early on in the evolution of planet Earth. Now there's another major scenario of bombardment that took place sometime later, it's called the Late Heavy Bombardment. This is an image that I stole from Dave Kring on the Lunar and Planetary Science Institute website. You see the moon with all the craters right here. This is here, there's no unit really. This is a measurement or an attempt to measure the flux of impactors on Earth and you have time right here. As you can see, the story of the Late Heavy Bombardment calls for a very rapid decrease after the moon forming impact of the impact rate on Earth and then a spike located around 3.9. This is called the late heavy bombardment of the solar system. It's been advocated for the last 25-30 years. As a matter of fact, it started in the 70s with the lunar um, Apollo program. It calls for a very steep one peak of heavy bombardment right after a very quiet period. This is a theory that makes it very nice for the Aegean on Earth. The first 500 million years on Earth would basically occur on a planet that's called a cool early Earth where there is no major destructive impact. This is just one theory. There are several other views of it. There's one view that calls for a continuous decrease of the impact rate along the yellow line that you can see right here. And of course, if you do that, you don't have a cool, nice, livable early Earth because you're being bombarded by big projectiles for the entire course from 4.5 to 4.0. And then there's a more recent theory that is something in between. And like usual, something in between theory, I really don't like them too much because they don't explain much and they make everybody happy. Anyway, if you believe in the blue curve or the pink curve or the yellow curve, it's really up to you. This new vision is basically that you have a steep decline in the impact rate and then that you have an earlier steep, some, an early increase in the amount of projectile hitting the Earth again. It's starting somewhere, you can put it at 4.3, 4.2, it's really a little bit up to you, everybody puts it somewhere. And you go up 
and then you have a very slow decline in order to accommodate for different things that are happening. Remember that the first rocks on Earth in Ishua Greenland are at 3.8. There's no real rock record before that except for bits and pieces. You have the first traces of life about 3.5 absolutely confirmed. And then you have thick ejecta layers, and I'm talking very thick material produced by an impact and being ejected from the crater. This is what I'm going to talk to you about later, but learn that these guys here, all the red dots that you can see here, are the only ejecta that we know in the Precambrian, and they are really big. So all these impacts that you can see here were probably made by projectiles that were at least 10 kilometers, maybe 20, maybe 50 kilometers in size. So this slow decline in the late heavy bombardment can still explain these big collisions between meteorites or projectile and the Earth after 3.5. So there's a lot of controversies on this late heavy bombardment, lots of discussions going on. I don't really know if we can solve this without going back to the moon and resampling the moon in detail. It's basically, there's a very steep late heavy bombardment hypothesis here, which is the work of Graham Ryder in the early 90s, is basically based on the fact that <coughs> a lot of the moon sample that we have date most of the craters at the oldest around 3.92. There's no older crater material on the moon. This could be biased. As you can see here, this is a view of the largest lunar crater. You should read here, this is the Apollo sampling area. And this could be, there could be a bias. You see three big craters here that likely influence the sampling of the Apollo mission. There could be a bias that Apollo did not sample the moon in a very, or would I put it, in a very careful way. I mean, it's, all the samples are concentrated in this area. There's another argument also pointing to a very steep peak, is the fact of we have lunar meteorites. And lunar meteorites are not supposed to be coming from this zone, but they're supposed to be coming from all over the moon. Lunar meteorites could also point, well, lunar meteorites also point towards one spike at 3.9 something. So there's a lot of controversy. I don't think I'm going to solve it today. I just want to make sure that you are aware of it. And if you want to read the literature, there's a lot about it. If we extrapolate what we learn on the moon craters to the Earth, this is what you have to remember, is that you have craters that are probably the size of a continent taking place on Earth. It's easier to hit a big target like the Earth than to hit the moon. So you're going to have a lot of very large crater forming in this period. The causes, there are different explanations. There was a very nice one that was put together by Alexandre Morbidelli and his team. It's called the Nice model. It's basically calling for a spike in impactor hitting the Earth due to the migration of the gas planet. In short, the gas planet are not very stable in their orbit during the formation of the solar system. At one point, they decide to readjust. Basically, Jupiter migrates inward, the other tree migrates outward. You can imagine that this is going to create chaos in the asteroid belt, in the Earth cloud, in the Kuiper belt, and basically going to send all these projectiles towards the center of the solar system. Most of that will end up in the Sun, but quite a few will hit the Moon, Mars, the Earth, and so on. Now, they have changed their mind a little bit about this Nice model. No, and that goes together with the pink curve that you've seen. They want to make it a combination of leftover bodies from the accretion, so the very steep peak of my curve in the beginning, plus asteroid escaping from the innermost part of the asteroid belt. One way or the other, you need a lot of these projectiles to bombard the inner solar system, considering that a lot of the meteorites are going to end up in the Sun. So to make all these craters on the moon and all these craters on Earth, you really need a big reservoir of projectile. The consequences, if you have craters this large, they're going to vaporize the ocean, they're going to eject the atmosphere, they're going to create mega basin, they're going to stimulate volcanism, they're going to stimulate melting in the mantle, and they might even start plate tectonic, according to some people. At the same time, they're going to deliver organic matter and volatile to the Earth. So that is to talk about the really big impact, if we now look at planet Earth, compared to the Moon, we don't really see that many craters. You see all the big dots and the small dots. 
This is basically the diameter, 0 to 10, 100 to 300. I don't think we have too many 300 craters. You see the three big one cheeks loop here. I'm going to talk about it later. That's the one that killed the dinosaur. Sudbury in Canada here, that is the one that's producing all this nickel. That and platinum group element that's making Canada, Canada a pretty rich country in terms of mining. And this is the Vredevoort crater, which is the oldest one. It's fairly eroded and there's not much left to see. But those are the three big ones and there's a lot of intermediate sizes in between. Um, you notice also something about this picture is that the zones that are well studied in terms of geology have many craters. The North American shield here. Finland is the most cratered country in the world because they had a very good survey to find them. And you see that South America, it's improving in Africa. It's basically empty, I would say, almost of craters. So it's part of Russia right here. And it's not because these places are never hit by meteorites. So it's not a safe place to go live if you want to avoid an impact, but it's just because they're much less known in terms of geology and impact craters are not always easy to detect. If we also look at the distribution of crater, you can see this is basically the number of crater. This is the time scale. You can see that most of them are relatively recent here. Every time I have a box of about 50 million years, you see that many of them are very young. And you see that when we go down into the Paleozoic and the Precambrian, there are much fewer craters. Remember also that we live on a very active planet compared to the Moon or even compared to Mars, and craters are going to be eroded. There's going to be, for every impact on the continent, there's going to be one in the ocean. And you know that we've mapped the bottom of the ocean not as well as we've mapped the Moon. So basically, many, many craters craters missing, they can also be filled by sediment or they can be completely eroded or covered by glaciers in Antarctica. If I talk a little bit about the distribution of craters, I told you that the younger craters tend to dominate. This is again the count. This is different groups of about 30 million years. You see the last one are the most common one. They are for, of course the best preserved, but I have two spikes here. And one spike is apparently in the late Devonian, about 320, 350 million years ago. And I have another spike right here in the middle order vision. This is an interesting case because there are many craters there. And some people made the analogy that this is also the same time that we find in sediment micrometeorites. There is about 466 million years ago, in sediment that age, there's an incredible peak in micrometeorites. And this is linked to the breakup of the L-chondrite parent body in the asteroid belt. And they're going to deliver micrometeorite, small projectile, as well as dust that is detected by its helium-3 signature. And here you see a fossil from the um, Ordovician, right here, you see it very well, with a micrometeorite right next to it. This is found in Sweden and in China, and Berger Schmidt and his group has advocated that maybe this spike in extraterrestrial material from dust to micrometeorite to a few big craters was responsible for what is called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. At the same time, after the Cambrian explosion of life, this is a moment in the history of life, the middle late order vision, where we really have a big increase in biodiversity. Could it be triggered by all the arrival of this extraterrestrial material in the ocean? Maybe. Another thing that is interesting to look at, okay, I still have my curve here, and now I draw it further down in time going into the Precambrian, the Proterozoic, and the Archean. And here, we go back to the ejecta layer that I showed you on the late heavy bombardment um, figure. You have the late Devonian, middle order vision with the explosion of biodiversity. And then we have a couple of craters right here. Fredefor, the largest one, some people estimate it could be more than 250 kilometers in size. You see the age, it's about um, 2,000 million years ago. You have Sudbury, the big um, 
nickel deposit at 1800 and you have the shoemaker crater that's a little bit smaller at 1600. There's a couple of very poorly dated crater right here but it's for this entire period there are very very few crater that we know of. Is this a preservation effect? I remind you also that there was a snowball earth episode here when the entire planet was probably covered by ice. This would have a tremendous erosion power on the craters and would make them disappear. But we have preserved, as I told you before, at different levels you know, here 2.4 to 2.6 billion years ago, 3.2 to 3.5 almost, we have these ejecta layers. And these ejecta that are being shown here are extremely thick, resulting from projectile that form crater, which we have never seen and with very unlikely we're ever going to discover them because they must have been recycled by plate tectonics several times now. But the ejecta this preserve is really thick much thicker than the one that killed the dinosaur at the KT boundary. So we suspect that they came from projectile much larger. So do we have a preservation effect here or do we have, I would say, a decrease in the impact rate? It's also possible. If we go on the other side of the scale and we go right here in the late Eocene, about 35 million years ago, there's another reason for suspecting a massive arrival of extraterrestrial material. If we look in the late Eocene, so it's not that far away, it's about 35 million years ago, we have several craters. We have the Papigai crater, 100 kilometer in Siberia, the Chesapeake Bay crater in um, the United States on the East Coast. We have met, not so well dated the Mr. Stin crater in Canada. We have, um, I cannot read them, this is one Apitai also in Canada, in the Autumn Crater in Northern Canada right here. This is Popeye, Autumn, Mistastin, Wanapitae, Chesapeake Bay. And what you see right here is the ejecta that is produced by Popeye and the ejecta that is produced by Chesapeake Bay. You see that these two craters are very well dated and they have almost the same age. So could they be a, a joint projectile? Probably not. I remind you also that if we have all these craters here, we also probably have some ocean craters that we don't know of. And you have the size of all the craters here. So these two, the two ones right here, Papagai and Chesapeake Bay are pretty big ones. This is probably close to 80 kilometers or maybe a little less. This is close to 100 kilometers. So they are really large. If we look in deep sea core, drilled in the ocean, we find the ejecta from these two craters at two very distinctly different levels. So they are not occurring at the same time, but if you believe the stratigraphy and the biostratigraphy, you have the ejecta from Chesapeake Bay right here, the ejecta from Papigai here, I'm not going to go into the detail, but you have between 10 to 20,000 years between the two. So two big projectile coming at you know, almost the same time, but not really together. If we go then to the stratotype, to the location where this Eocene Oligocene boundary is defined, I remind you also that in terms of paleontology, this was called in the past the Grand Coupure, which means a major change in vertebrate fauna, and it's also the beginning of the big cooling that we're still in today that marked the beginning of ice on Antarctica and the cooling of planet Earth. So the Eocene is the warm period, the Oligocene is the cool period. If we look at the stratotype right here, we find some interesting information. We probably have three iridium anomalies that are considered to be tracer of extraterrestrial material. And these are projectile big ones. And we have also an anomaly in the helium-3, which is tracing not crater, but fine dust, interplanetary dust particle arriving as extraterrestrial material. We have so three possible peaks right here. I'm showing one of the anomaly right here. It's a very small one. We have in there ejecta about, you know, an elevated iridium anomaly. We have shocked quartz, and I'm going to talk about them later. And we have spinel that are also of extraterrestrial origin. So the idea is to look at this late Eocene, and there's another peak in the late Miocene. This is age, and this is the concentration of helium-3 in sediment. And helium-3 is fluctuating here, and then you have one spike 
here and another spike right there. If we look at the craters, this is interesting. You see we have a couple of large craters, including the dinosaur killer right here, no helium-3. We have this spike with two big projectiles and the helium-3, and we have this one with only helium-3. So how is this interpreted? Well, this one, the late Eocene, was proposed by Ken Farley about 20 years ago as the arrival in the inner solar system of long period comet triggered by a change, a catastrophe in the Earth cloud. And this one was viewed as the late Miocene dust shower from a major breakup in the asteroid belt. And this is creating the Veritas asteroid family. So no crater, just interplanetary dust particle, the two coming together, and here craters alone without fine dust. Well, about 20 years ago, we were also working on the Poppy Guy crater in Siberia. This is the cliff. This is impact melt provoked by the melting of the rock during the impact. This is some example of it. This is the Mi-8 helicopter that we used to go back and forth. This is basically almost on the Arctic Ocean in the middle of nowhere. It takes eight hours by helicopter from the nearest village. And what we did, we sampled all this and we tried to see if what was provoking this late Eocene cluster of impact, at least for Poppy Guy, was really made by Comet. We were suspecting at the time that Comet would be carbonaceous chondrites. Well, when we did a little bit of magic using platinum group element ratio, and you have them, you have ruthenium over rhodium and uh, platinum over palladium right here, you see all the different groups of meteorites in red, and you see the Poppy Guy crater and the Wanapitai crater, that's a small one in Canada that we did, and they cluster around the alchondrite. So it's not very close to the carbonaceous chondrite. Then the group of Frankite at UCLA did some work on the chromium isotope, also on the ejecta layer coming from Poppy Guy, and they came up with the idea of an H chondrite making the Poppy Guy crater. So this led all of us to propose that instead of a comet shower, we're dealing also with an asteroid shower responsible or triggered by a breakup in the asteroid belt. It's one or the other, you know. Then there's a recent paper, and it's a 2019 paper that's also very interesting, that is using the images of, taken from the Moon, the re very recent ones, to basically try to estimate the number of very young lunar craters, all the ones larger than 10 kilometers. And they did that, and they speculate that for the Moon, there's a rate increase in the last 300 million years of about 2.5, 2.6 times more craters than in the past. You have the distribution here of the craters, okay? And you see in red, this is the older craters and this is the younger craters. So you seem to have more cratering in the last 300 million years than before. Well, they also estimate the size, frequency, distribution of lunar and terrestrial craters for a diameter higher than 20 kilometers, and you see that both of them seem to match fairly well. So it means that the Earth and the Moon are struck by the same population of impactor, and that contrary to what I was saying before, the Earth has not lost so many craters as we might think. And if you believe that the Moon is recording all of them, the Earth is really preserved them fairly well, or much better than we thought. So a deficit in crater between 300 and 650 could be due also to this lower flux that they are advocating for the Moon. The exception, the, the very big craters that we know from the Precambrian, might also be the only ones, and that's, that's a little bit the discussion, might also be the only one that have survived these episodes of snowball Earth, that everything else has been completely eroded by putting the Earth in the freezer and freezing the planet, ocean, and continent under kilometers of ice. So this is a debate that's interesting. It's a very good observation based on the lunar data. Can we extrapolate it to the Earth? Maybe. And is it teaching us something about the crater frequency? Also maybe. But yeah, we might be in the last 300 million years in an increased bombardment period. Nothing compared to the late heavy bombardment.
things for us. Now, if we want to study craters a little bit more in detail, we need to understand how they form. And that's why I have a whole bunch of very nice crater images here, going from very small size, you see a nice ball shape, to more complex structures right here. These are about 40 kilometers. And if you form a crater on a planet like the Earth with a solid crustal surface, crust being sediment, granite, you usually, if you have a very small projectile, you're going to melt some material, you're going to shock it, and you're going to create a simple, nice, ball-shaped crater, like easy to eat your cereals from, you know, it's a very nice, very regular shape, nothing special. This is for anything smaller than four kilometers. And these numbers that I'm giving you, you could have one at 4.5. It's, it's very approximate. It also depends on how strong or what is the density of your target. Anyway, let's take four kilometers as a limit. If we get anything bigger than that, we get to a very, very complex structure that is a little bit more complicated to understand. You see this crater right here? This one is between 20 is between 4 and 20 kilometers, you have formed what's called a central peak. And anything above 25 kilometers, you form a central peak ring. It means that you're going to have the center of the cavity that basically bounces back, goes up. You can see it here. So material that is pushed down by the impact, by the shock wave excavating the target, is pushed down. And then just like when you throw a stone in a lake, you have something bouncing back. And it's exactly what we are seeing right here. And when you get to a little larger size, when this here, this, I would say, rising structure gets too big, you tend to have a little bit of a collapse in the center. And this is what we call this peak ring. So simple ball-shaped model, complex crater with the center being uplifted, and that's the rebounds of this transient cavity. When you have a crater, you excavate a cavity down to two, maybe three times the diameter of the projectile, and this material bounces back. I'll show that to you in a few minutes, but this is what you have to remember. Small one, big ones, and the big ones are very complex. Even more complex, we can have multi-ring structure. This is known from the moon. This is Orientale almost a thousand kilometer in diameter. And if you look at it, this is a low. Okay, this is a depression. You have one ring right here, you have a second ring right here, and you have a third one right here. This is a multi-ring crater. We don't really understand for sure they form, although some recent progress were made, and there's some paper using modeling that can come up with a very good way of, I would say, fluidization of the target to make the structure. This is a shuttle image of the Vredevoort um, crater in South Africa. We said it's about 250. It's very old. So I remind you of its age. It's right here. It's very old. It's highly eroded. But we could probably see something that make us think of several ring. This is Sudbury. Sudbury in Canada has been elongated by tectonic, so we don't recognize much of its structure. And Cheeks Loop, the last one, is buried under the coast of Yucatan. And this is a 3D um, gravity anomaly model. And if you look at it, we might be able also to find several rings. Whoops, I'm going too quickly. Okay, let's do it quickly. Here we go. See, there might also be several rings. It's an ongoing discussion. Is Cheeks Loop a multi-ring crater or not? It could be. This is a very nice representation by Richard Grieve of what theoretically a multi-ring crater should look like. You have each ring would be, I would say, outlined by normal fault going towards the center of the crater. You have a huge central structure that bounces back and you have in red molten material on both sides of it. This is one half of a very, very large crater. So imagine that this structure together would be about 200 kilometers. If we go into the detail in craterology and how do we form a crater, this is something that we can divide in several images. This is an explanation for the Ries Crater in Germany that I also invite you to visit. There's a nice museum and very nice outcrops. It's a geopark, so you can learn everything about the crater by just looking at um, the poster for the geopark. This is the projectile arriving with a velocity of at least 20 kilometers per second. 
So it's a very high impact. I also would like to point out that every projectile arriving except for an angle less than about 15 degree will create a very, I would say, centralized crater. Okay, an elongated crater will be for anything less than 15 or 10 degrees. So every impact, be it vertical or at 45 degrees, create the same type of crater. So craters are very simple structure when you really think about them. This is the projectile, it's arriving very quickly. The first thing that is going to happen, you're going to see some material being ejected here. These are the famous tectites. They are found in the Czech Republic, so several hundred kilometers away. And they are ejected from the side of the cavity that's opening right here. They're coming from this zone and they are ejected on trajectories and they end up several hundreds of kilometers, or if the crater is really big, they can go to thousands of kilometers. Then we have the excavation. The crater buried itself, or the projectile is vaporized and buried itself in the ground. You see a curtain of ejecta that is being produced right here on the side. You see this cavity that you're excavating within the target rock. This is done by the propagation of shock wave. Okay, the shock wave have an incredible velocity, they are extremely, the pressure here and the temper are huge and of course it's losing its energy with an R square um, equation, okay, you basically lose it very quickly and it turns into seismic waves. This is also at the same time the vaporization of the projectile and a good part of the uppermost part of the target rock is going to create this huge vapor cloud that goes up into the atmosphere. Some of the material is going to fall back right here in the crater. You have excavated here at the side, you're pushing all this material that is being dumped on the side of the crater. And you continue and basically all this falls back. And this is the situation that you end up with. You have the central peak going up, you have a depression right here, and you have all this material that is on the side that's kind of chaotic. Another way of looking at it is to follow this little cartoon. You see this is the melt, you have material being ejected, material being pushed, and then you notice the appearance of these normal fault on the side. They're basically the fact that you excavate this transient cavity, okay, all the material here is gone, and on the side of the crater, the crater is much larger than the transient cavity because you have collapsed along normal fault on the side. So this comes up with a diameter that's shallower than the excavation of the transient cavity. I remind you it goes to maybe two times the projectile diameter. So if it's 10 kilometers, it's going to go down to 20 kilometers. But the crater at the end is basically shallower but larger because you have the collapse on the side. And here in the center you have material that goes back up. To see that in another view, this is the projectile going into the crust. You have fusion, you have vaporization, you have shock metamorphism. It means that you're changing the crystallographic structure of some of the grains and you have the propagation of the shock wave. They start at more than 100 gigapascal and they lose this strength very quickly. So these dynamic shock waves propagate away from the point. And I repeat, all the craters are formed, no matter what the angle of impact is, they form in the same way. This is again, and this is known by modeling, you have this vapor cloud that goes up and sometime, if you're lucky, this is a fragment from a small impact in the southern ocean, about 2.3 million years ago. This is a small fragment of the meteorite that's been preserved from this cloud right here. You have, as I was showing you, these tectites that are ejected right here. You have the shock metamorphism, the shocked quartz with planar deformation feature that you can see here. They form in this zone and can also be expelled from the crater. You have the melt rock. This is again this poppy guy melt rock from Siberia. You see, this looks like a lava, okay? If you're not experienced with crater material, you could consider this is a lava and it's forming right here by the fusion of these rocks. You have suevite, which is a rock, it's a sedimentary rock, to be honest. It's melting material 
you see it right here. It's coding a class of granite that is coming from deeper. This is also from the Reese crater. And you have a lot of black melt around my pen here. And this is probably going up with the basal part of the vapor cloud and it falls back in the crater or outside the crater. You have zones completely fractured. This is a breccia from the Garnos crater. This is more towards the side and further away from the impact point. And you have deep into the basement. This is from the Vredevoort crater in South Africa. You have injected pseudotacalite melt. So this is in the basement. The basement is shaken. There are openings being created and melt is injected in them. And this is what you see right here. If you look at the Reese crater again, this is the crater. You can see it very well. This is the inner ring. This is the central zone where a lake will develop. And this is the crater rim here. When you drive into the Reese crater, if you know that you're in a crater, you notice it immediately. I mean, when I go there in the field with students, I tell them we're going to get into the crater 20 kilometers in advance, start looking, and at the moment that we enter, moment that we go over this outside crater rim, they notice it because you clearly go up and then you go down into the crater. And we have the same material with this suevite, the melted plastic material with melt and fragments right here. We have here suevite on top of this chaotic breccia. This breccia is made of blocks from all the different components of the target material that were expelled as I would say they were bulldozered out of the crater and the melt falls back on top of it. So the melt is going up and then falls back. And this is very classical. You have blocks of granite. You see this block right here. This is in the inner peak ring zone. This is a block that is coming from deep. You have here, and that's very interesting, this is a new quarry that was excavated for cement production. And if you look at the stratigraphy, I don't know if you can see it, but these beds are going like this, and these guys are going like this. So this is really huge chunk of Jurassic limestone that were turned upside down. And they're right here at the edge of the crater. There were some drilling, finding suevite inside the crater. There is a little bit of melt, very, very little. There's no real impact melt at the Reese crater. There's an impact melt breccia. It's com compared to other craters, Reese has very little melt. And there is lake sediment on top of that. Now, I also have to be very careful here. And when we talk about impact crater, it took a very long time before people accepted crater as a geological process on Earth. They were observing crater on the moon, but say that the Earth was protected by some mysterious reason. It took many years to accept Sudbury as an impact crater. This was seen as a deep magmatic intrusion that was producing all this nickel. It was a very complex process, and it's a lot easier to explain by a projectile coming from above, but it matter. So right now, the pendulum is swinging in the wrong direction, in my opinion, because people see craters everywhere. And not everything that is wrong on Google Earth is an impact crater. This is a very poor impact crater, in my opinion. It's in the Greenland. It's supposed to be 12,000 years old. It was published last year. This is under the ice of Greenland. If you see, this is what it looks like. It should be 30 kilometers in size, and this is supposed to be the central peak. If you look at the image on Google, okay, there's absolutely no uplift. I remind you, if this is 12,000 years ago, and you have impact melt that formed with a crater of 30 kilometers, it still will be smoking. You still have the melt melted, and you should have a very high peak here. Could be eroded by glaciers, but I'm not sure glaciers have this magnitude. Anyway, big question mark, and all of a sudden comes a second crater in the same area, about 183 kilometers from the first one. And this would be about 80,000 years old. So this is a place I recommend do not buy real estate in Greenland because you're being bombarded by craters all the time. Okay, you have to be very careful. Not everything that looked around on Google Earth on, on any type of remote sensing imaging is a crater. To have a real crater, 
there's a whole bunch of criteria that you need to follow. And you need to have real field work to understand them and to document them on Earth. So they could be crater. I'm not closing the door completely. But um, they could be craters. Okay, let's be honest. And if they are craters, they're going to have to drill to really find and prove it. But so big a crater 12,000 years ago was another one 80,000 years ago. I mean, I'm a little bit suspicious. Anyway, the criteria to identify craters are very clear. And they're basically based on mineralogy or geochemistry. They're right here. This is a temperature pressure diagram. This is for quartz. If you see that you increase the pressure, you're forming shadow cones. These are basically something we don't really understand how they form, but they are often present at impact crater, and it's a big chunk of rock that seems to have been, how, how would I say, imprinted by the passage of the shock wave. And you see, you recognize it's really a nice shatter, a, a, a cone form. Interesting. You have planar deformation features, which are right here, or you can have the formation of coesite and stesovite right here, depending on the intensity of the pressure. You have PDF forming right here, and if you go above that, you start to melt and you form diaplectic glass. So if you go to too high a pressure, you're basically melting everything. If you want to use uh, Raman spectra, you can distinguish between quartz, coesite, and stesovite fairly easily. So these planet deformation features are really melting along crystallographic direction of the quartz or of the feldspar or whatever mineral you're shocking, it can be zircons as well, you basically have preferential zones of melting. This is simply because many um, crystals have different forms depending if you're a low pressure or high pressure phase. If you're in a tectonic regime, you can really switch from one phase to the other crystallographically, this happens. If you have the passage of this dynamic shockwave very quickly, there's no time for the cr crystal to choose, I would say, its high pressure form. And what it does, it's going to melt along preferential crystallographic direction. This is what we see. These are very strong criteria. Other criteria are the anomaly in siderophile elements, mainly the platinum group element, platinum, rhodium, iridium, osmium. <clears throat> isotope anomaly in the osmium isotope or in the chromium isotope and eventually, as I mentioned earlier, the presence of helium-3. Magnesium, uh, nickel-rich magnesium ferrite spinel is also characteristic of impact. To show that quickly, these are the siderophile element. A non-differentiated meteorite coming from the asteroid belt will be completely different from the Earth where all the iridium is concentrated here in the core because iridium, platinum, they like to have, um, I would say, chemical relationship with iron, and they sank to the core of the planet as it formed. If we look at the concentration, you see that at the crust of the Earth, you have usually concentration at parts per trillion. So one atom of iridium for a trillion of all the other atoms. If you look at all the platinum group element, this is a typical profile of the crust, of the Earth. Okay, you go for iridium to gold. This is what we find in red in a chondrite, and this is, for example, the impact melt in Popeye, which is clearly contaminated by the projectile. You can plot that in many different ways. Another way of plotting it is iridium versus chromium. This is the terrestrial field. This is chondrite, meteorites, and this is everything in between. We have poppy guy in here, we have Wanapitae, Moroqueng, Garnos, uh, I forgot which one this is. This is Cheeks Loop um, impact melt, it's very little of it. And this is the KT boundary iridium anomaly, you see it's all over the place. Another thing that you can do playing with platinum group element is that you can often identify the projectile by using those platinum group elemental ratios. Another way of doing it, as I was saying, is isotopic system the rhenium to osmium decay, and the chromium isotope. Rhenium-osmium is very low in meteorites. The crust has a lot more. So basically, when you have extraterrestrial material reaching the Earth, it triggers a very low, constant, a very low ratio. The same thing for the chromium isotopes. 
you see that chromium plot on Earth and the Moon on this zero artificial line right here. The carbonaceous chondrite do plot here, the chondrite in the Martian meteorite right here. So this is really due to early planetary manganese to chromium fractionation. Another way to study impact crater is to recreate it in the lab. And a lot of people do that. This is a new lab that's being installed at UC Davis. I chose this because I want to do a little bit of advertising for my university. The shock compression lab that is in the basement, you see these two big cannons, well they use to shoot projectiles at different targets at very high velocity. And they can shoot them at 8 kilometers per second to recreate the dynamic shock condition experience by rock and minerals during these collisions. Another way of doing it, this is some experiments we did when I was in Germany, and you see there, this is the result of a projectile being shot on a target, and some very elegant and very low-cost experiment done in Thomas Kenkman lab in Freiburg is basically to take floor and glass beads and to drop something on them or shoot with, with an air gun and you see there's a central peak and there's a crater rim and there's an exterior rim. This is about three or four centimeters. So you can really do impact craters in different ways and the last way of doing it is basically using hydrocode modeling to mimic the impact process. There is a website if you like to play catastrophe or you like to play God, it depends. You can basically insert the size of your projectile, the velocity of arrival and you can bombard any place on earth. And this is the hydrocode modeling. You see this is a hundred kilometer. This is depth also into the mantle. These are different layers. You can recreate whatever you want. And this is what happens with your modeling. This is work by Bieta Pierazzo. Now that you are a specialist in cratering and that I have a little bit more time left, I'm going to talk about the Chicxulub crater. Okay, or I call it Mitrite in Dino Out. So I'm going to go relatively quickly here because I don't have that much time. You all know what happened here. This is a success story. We go from this to this. This is called the KT or the KPG boundary. This is probably the best explanation so far. They were smoking too much. There's also the fact that we're losing all these organisms. There's a lot of victims from this mass extinction. We lose 60 to 70% of the earth fauna and flora. And if you look in very great detail, this is not a montage, this is a real scenario. This is the uppermost Cretaceous in Italy. This is the clay layer in between and this is the clay, this is the, the Cretaceous, sorry, this is the tertiary at the top. You see one type of foraminifera, you see many different times, they're big and they're very elegant and they're very highly decorated. They're much more sophisticated than the opportunistic species right here. And this is over a couple of centimeters. So we have a major transition and if we follow this Cretaceous tertiary boundary all over the world, I'll see you use the use KT boundary instead of KPG because, I mean, just tell you that I've been doing this for a while. If we go all over the world, the KT boundary or the KPG boundary is marked by a thin clay layer. This is Italy, two centimeters, deep ocean, deep ocean of the Cretaceous, many foraminifera, they're all gone. We are in the deep water, nothing should happen there but it does. This is the same thing at another location in Italy. You can see it, same thing. Now we go to Denmark, the same KT boundary clay. We continue and we're gonna go to Caravaca in Spain, same thing. I'm probably boring you to death right now. This is New Zealand, the same thing as well. And if you're not convinced, I can show you Northeastern Mexico. Uh, sorry, the, the southern Mexico, the same clay layer as well. And then I'm going to take you to the western interior. And here it's slightly different. You see this KT clay? It's right here, but if you look in great detail, you see my green line? This is a coal bed, so it has nothing to do with the story. But you see above and below. And if we dissect that, we find rounded spherules like this one right here which is about 200 micrometers in size, and we find the iridium and the shocked quartz concentrated right on top here. Indeed, it's this anomaly, the discovery of this KT boundary anomaly in iridium, this is the concentration, so you go up 
here in the deep ocean of the Cretaceous and you measure iridium in parts per trillion or picogram per gram and you have almost zero and you get closer and it starts to wiggle a little bit and then you go all the way to the clay right here and as you can see this is 200 and the peak is at 3000 and so it's somewhere around here. Okay. This is Jan Smith and Walter Alvarez who were basically the discoverer of this. Jan in Spain, Walter here at Gubbio. And you can see the KT boundary and this tells you that this has triggered a lot of interest in the geological population because everybody has a piece. You don't really see it too well on this picture but you can put your entire arm in the hole that is right here, in the boundary. It has been sampled to death. Everybody has a piece. And if you go there you're going to find it because it's Gola del Iridio there's a tourist sign. The iridium anomaly, this is work that I did a long time ago, is all over the place. The size of the dot is proportional to the concentration. You don't really see a pattern. On the other hand, when you look at the shocked quartz, and this is one of these quartz, and you see the planar deformation features that are triggered by the passage of this shock wave, more than five gigapascal, usually pressure that you don't encounter in tectonic settings. And you see the shocked quartz is a little bit of a hint in terms of distribution. You see there's a lot of big ones in North America and they are very abundant in the Pacific Ocean. Right here in Europe, there's not so many of them. I don't think this is fully correct, but here they're very abundant. They're very abundant, and very large here, and they're fewer to be found right here. We also have these ferules that I was telling you about and we have two types and that's a confusion that a lot of people are making. They are the microtectites that I was showing you for the Reese crater. This is the material from the surface that is being ejected on, I would say, almost a ballistic trajectory. They are shown right here and they found all around the Gulf of Mexico but not further. These are the microcristites, they are pure glass. Here they are glass and Olivine or different spinels also, they're found all around the world. You see all the yellow dots right here. So this is worldwide and this is about 4,000 kilo, 4, kilometers from the crater, the crater being here. If you go to field work in Mexico, you're going to find that your small clay layer right here is now a four meter thick sandstone bed. So it's a lot thicker. We are also, we're in northeastern Mexico, deep ocean, Maastrichtian ocean deep ocean of the tertiary and you see this big unit right here. This is the same KT boundary as you have right here. This led us in the early 90s to suppose that there was a crater buried under Yucatan. It's right here. If you go there you don't see anything. It's really halfway on land, halfway in the ocean. This is a cenote. This is the only marking that you can have of the crater and they concentrate along the rim of the crater probably according to hydrogeologists of the area because still some of the crater morphology buried about a thousand of sediment below the surface is still playing, it still has a role in favoring the dissolution of the carbonate of the Cenozoic carbonates in making those nice cenote where you can go for a swim and where the Mayan used to throw people according to the legend. The red dots that you can see here, all the drill link that happened. There was some old one by the Mexican oil company looking to reproduce the Cantrell oil field. This is a big oil field that's right here that's producing a lot of oil from Mexico. Well they found that there was a basin shaped morphology here. That's why they drilled it in the 70s. They found no oil. They found what they considered to be volcanic rocks. I'll show you what they are. There's a couple of shallow drilling done by the UNAM the University um, in Mexico City offshore, um, outside the crater right here. There is the Yaxco portal oil that we did with ICDP 2002 and the recent IODP 2016. If you want to see the morphology, what was the Gulf of Mexico like a hundred and, uh, sorry, 66 million years ago, you see sea level being 120 meters higher. You see the impact taking place on a carbonate platform and all the dots, points and everything that you see around here are locations that we have studied in detail. This is what we speculate to be the target. 
about three kilometers of carbonates and evaporite, then a small plastic layer of sandstone, and then Pan-African granites and gneiss, supposed to be 545 million years old. And the crater is now buried under a kilometer of sediment. You can see it on remote sensing. You see a gravity anomaly model where you can recognize one rim, another one right here. Magnetic anomaly from more iron in the rocks that were coming from deep and went back up. And another view of the gravity that's slightly different angle from here. If you really want to know what the crater looks like, you have to go to the moon. This is a very nice <coughs> enhanced image of the Schrödinger crater. It's a lot bigger, 320 kilometer. You see the central peak ring right here with the central depression. You see the crater rim and you have a good four to five kilometer difference between this point and that point right here. So if you look at the crater, you're really going to look down and it's going to be very impressive. So this is what Chicxulub looks like at depth. This is a very cartoon-like reproduction of it. You see here all the different drilling in red. You see what we suppose is supposed to be the melt sheet. You see the central uplift and you see the normal fold at the size of the crater. And it's about something between 180 to 220 kilometers in size. It's very difficult to pinpoint precisely. The story goes that in the early 90s, we received from the Mexican these old Pemex core that Pemex had drilled into this depression with the hope of finding gold. They were finding oil, sorry, they were very disappointed. And of course, a lot of the core disappeared. So you see, this is Chicxulub 1 and Yucatan 6. And the only samples that are preserved are right here. So we have two pieces from here at the depth of about. Um, 1,400 meters, and we have a few more in the Yucatan 6. So this is, of course, way too little to understand a crater of this size. This is why we tried for many years to have more drilling. But this already in the early 90s was very rich in teaching about the crater. We realized that in this part, this looks like suavite, they were molten carbonate, which attests that the calcium carbonate in the target were basically molten, vaporized for one part, releasing CO2, but also some of it recombined, CaO liquid recombined with CO2. We have a nice impact melt breccia and best of all, in this core right here, we got really pristine glass or pristine material that form at the moment of the impact, so remelted material. This has been dated by Argon Argon at the same time as we were dating the glass ejected from the crater. And this is what you can see here. They had the exact same age. And on top of that, not only do they have the same age, but they also correlate in terms of geochemistry. This is oxygen isotope. This is the composition of seawater. This is the strontium isotope ratio. And we have yellow glass and we have black glass and the cheeks loop impact melt and they all plot very nicely. And this yellow glass is extremely rich in CAO, demonstrating that you have a major contribution from the carbonate and you can plot all that in nice curve going from seawater all the way to the black glass. There were some drilling after that outside and we see the exact same thing, a thick polymic breccia, just like what we see in the Reese crater. These are some of my students sitting on this Bunta breccia, which is a very chaotic breccia of, made of different blocks and the melt material, the suevite classed on top with molten material classed and this is really a clastic rock that went up and fell back. And this is exactly what we find in this UNAM. Then we drilled the Yaxca in 2002. This is right here. This was way too far away from the center of the crater to be very interesting, to be honest. And Yaxca is right here. I should say that we still got some interesting data out of it. I'm not going to spend any time dealing with the impact material because there's about 100 meters of it. That's it. But there's 900 meters of mega block zone. So we drilled into these big blocks. Remember in the Reese crater, I told you it's somewhere upside down. They were all tilted. Well, the question was, is this in place or is this tilted? Two different ways of doing them, of forming them. I'm going to show it to you on this here. This is the transient cavity. This is what you open in the crust. 
And this is where the central peak is going to form and going to go up. We can have two mechanisms. We can have the blocks coming with the red arrows from the sides of the crater along normal fault. And they basically from the external part and they collapse towards the center. Or they can be part of the transient cavity right here and they can be overturned, inversed in terms of stratigraphy and they can be overturned and land right here. So the question was how do we distinguish them? One would be autochthonous versus alloctonous in green. And since there's absolutely no biostratigraphy available in this core, it's carbonate, it's dolomite and it's evaporite. The only way was to do like we did is to look at strontium isotopes. This is the strontium isotope curve for seawater and we have an anchor point that is the um, Cenomanian Turonian Bonarelli event right here. And we recognize that in the core from Yaxcapol. So basically, in this mega block, we could identify this anoxic event and we basically reproduce the curve in terms of strontium isotope. We analyzed quite a few samples over the 900 meters of core and they mimic fairly well what we see right here, a dip and then a rising curve. So the idea was that based on strontium isotope, we checked that there was no diagenesis using calcium and oxygen isotope. It turned out to be fairly well preserved. And we can conclude that the upper Cretaceous is in stratigraphic position with no evidence for an overturn. So the reason they are there, those mega blocks that Yaxcapoil drill, is because they collapse and they're still in stratigraphic position along normal fault from the side of the cavity. No evidence for turning them. Then, of course, we wanted to do more and then came in 2016 the drilling of Chicxulub by IODP, this time offshore. This drilling had a great advantage is that we could locate it precisely on seismic line. It took years of advocating our case with IODP and the financing support of ICDP also to drill. And the idea was to drill, as you can see it right here, at the top of the peak ring. So really at the highest point within the crater. And I'm showing you right here, you have it on the peak ring. It's really visible on the seismic and drilling with the support of seismic is always better because you really know where you're going. And this is what we did. You see also these reflectors right here. They're supposed to be reflecting evaporites and you're going to see that the evaporites play a major role. I don't want to spend too much time because this is still ongoing research. But one thing that was very interesting is the fact that we ended up with impactite, suevite, impact melt in a transition layer right at the top. And then we encountered this highly beat up granite that is going very deep. And you see here, this is melt being injected into it. And when we look at the granite, it's right here. We have shatter cones. Remember, this is one of the clear evidence for impact. We have shocked quartz. We have foliated and shear in the granite. Clearly, this granite did not have an easy life. Okay, it was beat up pretty badly. Another thing that is very interesting when we look at this transition zone right here, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it either, but the one core, it's core 40, that we have sampled at different locations. This was recently published last year. You have really the Cretaceous tertiary boundary being present. You have the exact same thing. We are in the lower tertiary, the P0 paleozone that is marked by those very small opportunistic forearms is right here. You have this zone here with tiny microplankton survivor and you have the suevites right here. So what you see is that the crater was colonized very quickly after the impact. So life came back extremely fast in this crater. And it's really visible, all the organisms are back within a very short time. And how much time exactly? It could be something in the order of 10,000 years, or even faster according to some people. 
Then we did a lot of work in terms of geochemistry on this same core and we did micro XRF mapping but the thing that everybody was looking for and I'm sure you want to hear is is there the iridium anomaly there? Is it preserved? And the answer is yes and this is also a waiting publication. We had three places where we suspected it could be present. So we have several siderophile elements that are right here cobalt, chromium, nickel, and the iridium is right here. We have a little bit of an anomaly, but nothing serious right here, a little bit here, but we think that the KT boundary is precisely here with a little bit of a peak. And this is being analyzed, the, the data are in from our lab in, in Belgium, from Vienna, from Japan, and from the US, and all results are coherent the KT boundary with the iridium is probably right here. So not only do we have life coming back very quickly within the crater, but also the iridium that was probably in the vapor cloud is settling within the Chicxulub crater. To show you very quickly what we have below, this is the suevite, and just like in the Pemex core, we find foraminifera, we find calcium carbonates in it. We find differences in the suevite in terms of size of the clast and type of the clast. This is all being worked on at the moment. And then we get to the impact melt. You see this is clearly molten material with schlieren of different melt, different chemistry, very black one. And then we start to find different pieces of the granite. And the granite is important. It's telling us a very important part of the story. This is the entire granite sequence. I'm not going to take it into pieces. But you see it again, lots of shocked quartz, high porosity, lots of fault, cataclysmic shear, hydrothermal alteration, shocked quartz, very high pressure, over 10 gigapascal. There's a lot of shocked quartz in there. You see it here also. Really, this granite has been sheared apart in many directions. And this makes it possible for the first time, probably, this is also published in Science in 2016, to come up with a clear way of forming the Chicxulub crater and probably forming all the craters. There's two ways of forming craters. There's one way that is the nest melt crater cavity model. It's based on the moon and on field geology on many of the Canadian craters, for example. You see the story right here and you see this rebouncing, not going very high up, and it's full of melt, and it ends up with a crater like this. So if this is the case, we accept the peak ring to be made either of melt, completely melt, lots of pressure, or to be made of material coming from the side, which would be low pressure. And then there's another story that is basically derived more from modeling, I would say, that's the dynamic collapse model, and it shows that this central zone here really bounces back and really goes up very high. You see it here. And the difference is really if this shoots up, if this zone really shoots up like shown on model, we expect the granite to be highly shocked. And this is precisely what we observe. So if we have to distinguish between these two models here, again, the evidence of uplifted granite that is shocked to at least 25 gigapascal, the quartz, the shadow cones, the brittle fault, the foliated shear and everything, basically telling us that we had complete fluidization of these rock as they went back up. And this is what happened, but you can see it much better. So the dynamic collapse model really fits the formation of Chicxulub. This is what happened and you see it shooting. This is 20 kilometers, okay? So I'm still, I was probably much more on the side of the nested cavity model based on field work and looking at moon craters. I could not really imagine that the central peak zone would shoot up in the air so much and fall back. But if you look at the evidence coming from the granite, this is precisely what we get. Another big question is what is the role of evaporite? Because if you follow the story a little bit, Evaporite have to play a role in the global effect. One of the key questions, how do we transfer this incredible amount of energy generated by the impact into climate and into the biosphere to kill the dinosaur and 60% of the fauna on Earth 
on the continent and in the ocean. Flor, flora, fauna, everything dies. Well, one way of doing it is, of course, to release during the impact into the atmosphere a high volume of CO2. We had carbonate, they're going to be vaporized into CO2. Sulfur component, SO2 or SO3, we're going to talk, call them SOx, and fine dust. So when you generate the crater, and this is a, a new hydrocode modeling done by Artemieva et al. in 2017, you see the pressure here, the red is high pressure, the blue is less high pressure, and all this put together based on, in Yaxcapol, about 27% of anhydrite, so 27% of evaporite from the upper Cretaceous mega block, together with what we've seen in UNAM, and the fact that everywhere in the Chicxulub core, we never find or we find very little evaporite preserve. So this is teaching us that what is most likely happening is that all the evaporites is injected into the atmosphere. So the volume of sulfur component released is, giving, is being given right here. We go to these values of sulfur, these values of CO2, and you have to consider also a very high amount of dust. This is all going to go into the atmosphere, and if you believe in climate models like this one, also from 2017, this is the upper Cretaceous surface temperature. Remember that the Cretaceous was a period with no ice, no temperature gradient between the equator and the um, higher latitude or very little temperature gradient, what we have is a major cooling and one year after the impact they speculate that the temperature in general could be reduced by 25 degrees. And this is the pre-Cretaceous, the pre-impact world, this is the post-impact world. Of course there are many other things happening you have soot because you're producing wildfire because the vegetation will start to burn. You have nitric and H2SO4. If you release sulfur components into the atmosphere, well, they're going to react with water and, and sulfuric acid is going to be produced. You have cold from dust, you have sulfur, you have a CO2 greenhouse. And this is an extremely simplistic cartoon, but I love it and I keep on showing it because I think it explains it through to scientists and to children in the same way. This is the food chain on the continent before the impact with our great, great, great ancestors right here. This is the same food chain during the dust, blocking, photosynthesis, cooling. These guys are in deep trouble. He's finding plenty of food on a dead T-Rex. And when the condition come back, whoops, where did it go? Okay, it doesn't want to show. There's supposed to be this being gone, and this is the only survivor. I don't... You see it flashing. <laughs> okay? This is also the ejecta curtain being produced. You have this huge fireball rising out of the crater, and this is being ejected. This probably contains some of the, some of the spherules we've seen in the proximal ejecta. This is another model, kilometers, kilometers, temperature, Right here, vaporized in red, yellow to green is molten, blue is starting to melt, and magenta is fragmented solid. This is what we observe. Fireball, ejecta, and dust, CO2, and sulfur component. Now, if you give me a little bit more time, I can talk about the ejecta because Chicxulub is a unique crater. It's the only crater on the Earth where we really have a continuous ejecta blanket from the side, direct side of the crater all the way to um, great distances. This is a reproduction today of where all this ejecta is found. This is in green the completeness of KT boundary section. All the green ones are good section. This is material that is part of the ejecta curtain, the nickel rich magnesium ferrite spinel, nano diamonds also. I remind you that we start from here and we can find ejecta, we find an ejecta blanket right around the Gulf of Mexico, right here, right around the crater, I should say, and we find it right here. This is in Belize in, at the periphery of the crater. Then we go a little bit further 
and we are studying new sites in Elk Creek, North Dakota, and hopefully in Gorgonia offshore Columbia, which is basically material going into this direction and into that direction. And then we have the fireball layer with global ejecta going all over the world and finding them in Italy all the way to New Zealand. And this is what you have to imagine that's happened. All this ejecta went up and falls back onto the earth. I'll be very quick. This is Mexico, this is Quintana Roo, this is um, around Chetumal, and you have this very chaotic breccia that is result of the KT boundary. If you look at it in detail, you find bits and pieces, different blocks. You have to imagine this is an ejecta debris that goes as a bulldozer outside of the crater and goes all the way to about 360 kilometers from the crater and it's in Belize, it's still 15 meters th thick. You see it's very chaotic and in it you find pieces of the basement with shocked quartz. Right here, right there, you see it there. This is very weathered basement material from Cheeks Loop. If you take that apart you find quartz, some of them are shocked. And one of the best illustrations is this one. Look at this bed. This is a preserved bed of the Barton Creek Dolomite that has been pushed. It's not coming from the crater. It's just being taken by this huge ejecta curtain that is or ejecta wave or ejecta bulldozer that is going all over the, um, the Yucatan platform. If we go a little further, we are in the deep water. This is the platform and we are now on the slope right here and we have materials just like this um, it's fall in El Guayal. These are lapilli and sometimes we have shock quartz in the center and we think, we're studying that still at the moment, our model is not complete, we think that they form by accretion in the vapor cloud and they landed at about 1000 kilometers. If we go a little bit further, we now in northeastern Mexico, we have what we interpret to be a tsunami unit right here. You have mass flow deposits all around the Gulf of Mexico. You can see them here. We have lots of places where tsunami deposit could occur, including in the North Sea or in um, Croatia right now. And this is not the tsunami of this zone. There's a tsunami probably occurring right here because you have 11 to 12 um, seismic shaking on, based on the Richter scale, it's huge. You have that happening right here, but it's not going to be transferred here. This is simply earthquake. You know, you generate many, many earthquakes that in different places of the earth are going to trigger mass flow deposits. And you have it here. This is probably what happened on the coast of Mexico. This is a classic KT boundary in northeastern Mexico with an impact ejecta layer with spherules and glass arriving first. Again, we're in deep water here. Then the coarse tsunami unit, sand. And if you look at the paleocurrent direction, they're going in several directions here. So it's going back and forth. And then you have the classic iridium anomaly at the very top right here. In this sandy unit in the center, you find plant fragments that have been burned, so they were put on the barbecue, and most likely this is the result of the forest in northeastern Mexico burning. And if you look at this really nice model done by David Kring and his collaborator, this is all the burning places on earth, super forest fire spreading everywhere. At great distance, this is due to the ejecta re-entry through the atmosphere. It gets very warm, very hot, going through the atmosphere, land on dry vegetation and it's burned. This is the proximal glass that we find. We have different ways of explaining it. And based on the diagenesis and the original composition, we have different types of products. I'm not going to go into the detail. We do the same thing for the fireball material. You see all these different locations. We think that they produce different type of these um, spherules depending on their composition, including present weathering because they're not preserved in their original composition. We try to recreate back where they form based on trace element and isotopes. 
And a big question that is probably bothering you is what was the composition of the projectile? Was it an asteroid or a comet? Based on several lines of evidence, including pieces that were recovered by Frank Kite in the Pacific Ocean, this looks like it. It looks like a very rare type of carbonaceous chondrite. Based on the chromium isotope, told you this is a way to distinguish or to very well identify extraterrestrial products. We've got the carbonaceous chondrite and the KT boundary plots right next to it. So it's different from the chondrite and the Martian meteorite. And based on our little magic with platinum group element, we come also to carbonaceous chondrite this time. This is the Mohovwenk crater. Puppy guy would be here as well. Another question you may ask, and I'm sorry we don't see this so well, but this was about a year ago. Is there going to be another impact? Yes, of course. The question is when. So this is uh, an asteroid. It was between 0.5 and 1.2 kilometer. It came very close to the Earth. We're still 10 times the distance between Earth and Moon. It's about a year ago. It would have probably created a crater the size of recent Germany. Now you're going to follow the Earth right here and you're going to see this body coming right here. The Earth is right there. You see that they are not... Ah, it's a miss. <laughs> Now, there's a question that everybody's asking all the time. What about the Deccan Trap? Okay, this is the Deccan Trap. It's extremely impressive if you, if you go look at it. It's a huge package of volcanic rocks, basalt. It covers France in uh, by one or two kilometers. It's really extremely impressive. It's super weathered everywhere. So people say that the Deccan Trap is the only culprit that Chicks Loop has nothing to do with it. Chicks Loop could be the coup de grace to the biosphere after the massive Deccan eruption. And recently there's another hypothesis I'm going to talk to you about. But let me remind you, this is Gubbio. This is the extinction level. We don't really see much happening this is the uppermost Cretaceous, there's nothing happening here, but when we look up, where is my... God, this is... This is supposed to be a slide here, it should be coming. It's important, so let me just back up for a second and try to f show it to you. Hey, here we go. Okay, this is important. This is the osmium isotope. This is the KT boundary. This is, you can have oxygen, you can, you can look at all these signals right here. This one is very important. This is the osmium isotope probably coming from the Deccan Trap. It looks like the first eruption of the Deccan Trap is about 300,000 years before. And then you get a kick in the osmium signature of the ocean, which could be tracing the Deccan volcanism getting into the ocean. And then it looks like it's stabilizing before there's another kick that could be the material that is derived from the arrival of extraterrestrial material right here. So if you believe this, this would imply that there was a stabilization of the input of osmium into the ocean, which means that the Deccan Trap is either stopping or that it's not delivering that much new material as it was before. It could be. It could also be that the Deccan Trap is triggering all these changes that you see here, but they are not that major. These are changes that are occurring all across the Upper Cretaceous. But they could be cooling, they could be warming. If you look at fauna, there's almost no changes here. The big change is right at this level. So there was an interesting hypothesis put together by Mark Richard and Paul Rennie at Berkeley recently, is that based on the shaking, the seismic shaking generated by Chicxulub, they speculate that magma chambers all over the world should be stimulated. And that would include the Deccan Trap. If you look at the classical view of the Deccan Trap, these are the different flows. And this is all the good ages that exist. They are very critical about dating the Deccan Trap because they claim that some of the ages are not that precise. These are the best ages that exist, and you see there's a fairly large gap right here when we have this Polapur flow coming into play. This is their view. Instead of looking just at the thickness, they use the cumulative volume versus age. And it looks like all these flows right here 
are minor and they all happen before the KT boundary and then all of a sudden you start to have these two big flow right here after the boundary. If this is correct, it could be that this rejuvenation or this major outpour of Deccan trap lava is triggered by the impact, by seismic shaking the magma chamber that triggers the Deccan trap. This would not only be for the Deccan, every volcano around the world would be highly stimulated at this point. This is something that I think could be tested because instead of dating really highly weathered volcanism material or basalt all over the area, we could go to the ICDP Corina core right here. This is in central India. They've drilled several core for setting up a geophysical seismic observatory, but they drilled through the entire Dequin sequence, a thousand meter, all the way into the Precambrian basement. These are the core. They're well preserved. It's going to be a very hard work, but we are planning on doing that with the Berkeley group and some other people working on the deck and trap in this year, at the end of this year. We're going to try to see if we find this big polar poor flow. It's really well preserved. It's in course or it's fresh material. If this can be dated, and if indeed the major flow occurs close to the KT boundary, then there'll be a strong argument to see that there's a link between the two and that indeed the Deccan volcanism may have climaxed after the impact, triggered by the impact, and would have made the recovery of life a lot harder. And I'm going to stop here and I have Joe the Dino who is thanking you and remind you to be modest because we are on earth for 3.2. If you look at Luthi, that's about the age of our great-grandmother and the dinosaur dominated for more than 120 million years and I'll still make a really bit of a commercial for Walter's book T-Rex in the Crater of Doom. It's a really fun book and you should read it. It's tr translated in many languages and it's really fun to read. Questions? And if not, I will just show you the sponsors.